Okay. Did you know that Jesus taught God speaks to you? Speaks to you today. Jesus taught this, and he speaks to me today, too. And we're going to go right into Matthew chapter 22. It is something that the Lord came up with in the way that he approached this topic that was brought to him um, as he was teaching. You had some who would test his teaching about resurrection, about life after death, and he would have a comment on that. And... I think it's important to understand that it came from him. He's the one who said that the scriptures speak directly to us. You know, it's it's his point, not my point, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm just emphasizing it, calling attention to it. Um, but it comes a little bit later there in this chapter, in Matthew 22, verse 23, it says... Uh, some Sadducees came to Jesus. These Sadducees say that there is no resurrection. And they began to question him and pose this conundrum of seven wives, or one wife for seven brothers. I always get confused with the, with the Broadway play. It's uh, seven husbands for, for one wife. That's what it is, right? Yeah, seven husbands for one wife. Anyway, it doesn't make sense. They're wrong. So we can skip that. But the thing that happens is Jesus gives an answer to their question about the nature of people in the resurrection. But what we're interested in is the 29th verse of Matthew 22, when he said, in answer to them, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. So when they who didn't believe in life after death began to question him about this with a trick uh, that they were playing, his reply was, you don't even have to ask me about resurrection. Just by reading the book of Exodus, you should already know that there's life after death. That's what he's about to do here. And that's why he said, fundamentally, you're wrong. You know neither the scriptures nor the power of God regarding this. In the 31st verse, he continued this idea that we're focusing on. As for the resurrection of the dead, haven't you read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not God of the dead, but of the living. That's the answer. It was, again, at 31, have you not read what was said to you by God? Regarding the resurrection, have you not read what was said to you by God? This is the thing that we're focusing on today. Haven't you read? And, you know, the Sadducees were very knowledgeable. They knew the Bible. They had read, and, you know, if you're Jewish in the first century, and you seldom read or know very little of the Bible, you certainly know the passage where God said, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. It's the burning bush <laughs> in Exodus chapter 3. So yes, yes, they've read it. But the question of Jesus then means, have you not understood it? Really, why haven't you understood it? That's what that comes down to. But he's not God of the dead, but of the living. In other words, how can he be their God if they are dead? They must be alive. And you can know this already, he said. So let's look at what he's saying. 
because, uh, and, and it, as we say, it goes back into uh, Genesis and, and uh, the Exodus even, or Exodus rather, Exodus chapter 3 is where we're about to go, and then also back into Genesis. But the, the, the rationale for what Jesus is saying we should explore. I think because the Sadducees were actually quite familiar with the text, they got it. They understood the implications of what he was saying. But we're going to pretend that we don't have the same thing at the tip of the tongue, and we're going to go back and look at it together. Um, what they would have understood with the knowledge they had of that passage, I think would be as follows. In Exodus 3, verse 6, when God appears to Moses in the burning bush is the place that he says, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So this is the direct quote that Jesus made in Matthew 22, verse 32, when he said, have you not read what was written, what was said to you by God? And it's this quote, which is used again in the 15th verse when, when uh, Moses wants to know, you know, who do I tell them sent me? <laughs> and he tells him, God says to Moses, this, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. So the name by which God chose to make himself known to Moses and to the people of Israel is the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, which means he's the God of those who live by faith. These are the people who live by faith. Isaac was born to Abraham by faith. Jacob uh, took the place of the firstborn by the prophecy of God. These are spiritual heirs, and it's a spiritual meaning. But if you look back again in the second through the sixth verses here of Exodus 3, we are very clearly in the burning bush. This is the place where the angel of the Lord appears to Moses in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush, which catches Moses' attention, right? And he says to him, Moses calls out to him, God does, in the fourth verse. He said, here I am. He said, don't come near. Take your sandals off your feet. The place on which you're standing is holy ground. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face because, because he was afraid to look at God. But this is the place where he identifies himself to Moses. It's maybe the most famous passage at the time that Jesus was teaching the Sadducees. But when God said to him, I'm the God of Abraham, you know, where are we? Uh, when we say the God of your father, Abraham, is Abraham Moses' father? Well, not literally. <laughs> right? Abraham's father. First generation son is Isaac, and second is Jacob, and Jacob has 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. Right? How much time has elapsed? Well, about 400 years. About 400 years. When God first said to Abraham, way back there in Genesis chapter 15, that there was coming a time when his descendants would be numerous, he told him, know for certain, say Genesis 15, 13, that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they'll come out with great possessions. As for you, you will go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried in a good old age, and they will come back here in the fourth generation for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So God makes it very clear there. There's going to be a period of some 400 years where they are afflicted in a foreign land before they come back here. When God says to Moses, I'm the God of your fathers, these are his forefathers many years ago. 
And it is, in fact, approximately 400 years from the time that God is telling Abraham these things in Genesis 15 to the time of Exodus. They are the ones who are in service to a foreign nation. Who They are the ones who will be brought out, and that nation will be judged, and they'll come out with great possessions. That's exactly what happens in the Exodus. The children of Israel leave. They plunder Egypt by asking them to give them their stuff, and they do. Come, you know, when it says afterward, they shall come out. You know, that's the literal meaning of Exodus, is the way out, (laughs) the exit. But these people are gone, is what we're saying. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're, when, when God is saying this to Moses in Exodus 3, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have been dead for 400 years. That's what we're getting at. But there's a dissonance there, isn't it? Right? That's what we're getting at. They're dead, if you will, by human reckoning. But what God says to him is not, I was the God of Abraham, and I will be your God too. Uh-uh. He said, I am the God of Abraham. And he also said, I am that I am, or I am who I am. Right. He's ever present, he's ever real, but he said, he didn't say, I was the God of Abraham, he said, I am the God of Abraham. He's their God right now. So what does it mean? Well, it means you have to answer, how can he be the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, if Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are dead? If they're dead, then when God says he is their God, then he makes himself the God of the dead. He's like Hades. (laughs) But on the other hand, if they're alive, when God says this to Moses, and they are, they're still alive, then God is the God of the living, right? Which is exactly what the creation tells you in Genesis 1 and 2. When you look at it, everywhere it is God created every living creature. And even Adam, the man, became a living creature when God breathed his spirit into him, gave him the breath of life. God is the God of the living. He gives life. He's not for death and for destruction. He's for creation and renewal and for life eternal. So what does it mean? When It, it means, therefore, when he says, I am the God of Abraham and he is the God of life, that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, though they died in the flesh centuries before, they are very much alive. And that means that there is life after death. It's real. They have to be alive at the time that God says this to Moses. So there must be, therefore, life after death. That's the meaning. That's what Jesus is saying to them. Haven't you read that already? You should know this from Exodus. So that's the point that Jesus made in his teaching to them that we have to understand. That's how it works. That's what he was getting at. But what's interesting about that is that the application of this in Matthew 22, should we go back there? The application of this is that God speaks to you too. (laughs) And God speaks to me too. Not just to the Sadducees in the first century. If we look again at the 31st verse of Matthew chapter 22, let's take that a little more slowly this time. As for the resurrection of the dead, said Jesus... Have you not read what was said to you by God? Notice it for a moment. Haven't you read? Hmm. So it's written. Yes, it's written. Which is what scriptures mean, by the way. It just means writings, the things that are written. It's just a fancy word for writings. Haven't you read? But instead of saying, haven't you read what was written? 
since writing is assumed in reading. Haven't you read what was said? See, God speaks. The Bible is talking. And it's not the Bible itself. It's not the Word. This isn't Bibleolatry, you understand. What Jesus said is, read what was said by God. When you read this Bible, somebody is speaking. It's God. God is speaking. When you read this, you hear what God says, and it is being said to you. <clears throat> Have you not read what was said to you by God? This is the, the crux of the lesson. How does it, you know, how does this constitute God speaking to you? That's the thing that we got to talk about because this is what people are not doing. Right? Exodus 3 seems to be about somebody else, doesn't it? When he appeared in the burning bush, wasn't he talking to Moses? And wasn't Moses a citizen of Israel? Not America. And didn't he live, you know, centuries before, maybe millennia before us? Yeah. But that's not what it's about, is it? <laughs> yeah, what Jesus said in the 29th verse applies. You're wrong because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. They're wrong. And there's specific reasons for that. It is lack of knowledge of the Scriptures and lack of knowledge of the power of God. Now, when it comes to the knowledge of the Scriptures, well, they knew intellectually what it said. They knew the facts about the book, you know. And how many times do Christians sit through, you know, Bible classes that are actually history lessons, not teaching? not Bible teaching, or through other classes where the teacher feels like, well, I, I try to present both sides of every issue and let people decide for themselves. No, that's not spiritual leadership. Spiritual leadership is making an application of the Scriptures. There is right and there is wrong, and you can know what that is. In fact, you must know what that is. Your life depends upon it. People who do things like that are wrong. They don't know the Scriptures, though they have an intellectual understanding about it. They're not really understanding. They don't really get it. That all stays very academic. That stays you know, up in the stratosphere, not down here where we are with the choices we are making and the lives that we are living. You see? That's missing out. There's a couple of passages in the Old Testament that I thought were very useful. Genesis 18 is the first one, which is Genesis 18, 13, and 14. I will take just by themselves here. But it's the place where God first appears to Abraham and to Sarah, telling them that they're going to have Isaac. They're going to have this son. They're both very old. He's about 100, I guess. She's about 90. She was never able to have children, even when she was childbearing age, and she's well past that. But God tells him, you'll have a child. And she laughs, um, which is fine. Laugh at life. <laughs> you know, life is funny. <laughs> if you let it be, don't let it get you down. And God does have a sense of humor. And that interaction with Sarah is, hey, why did Sarah laugh? She said, oh, I didn't. He said, oh, but you did. <laughs> it's there. It's funny. God has a sense of humor. But um, really, uh, her laughter is uh, the word, laughter is the word translated Isaac. That's why they named him Isaac. 
But the reply of God is captured in Genesis 18, 13, and 14. The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I really bear a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? That's very important. Is anything too hard for the Lord? No. God said something beforehand, right? They haven't had the child yet. She's not pregnant, but he told them something beforehand that seems like it's impossible. Well, it is impossible with man, but with God, all things are possible. And certainly they do have this child, and we do have this nation of Israel that comes forth through this lineage. Then you have Jeremiah, right? We, we would go there too. Um, it's Jeremiah 32. This is a place much later in the history of the people, you know, where, where we were with Abraham is before the people are really a nation yet. Here in Genesis 32, this people is about to stop being a nation. They're about to be carried into captivity to Babylon. And yet God is telling Jeremiah, buy this piece of land and sign the papers. Sign all the paperwork. File, you know, put it into long-term storage, sealed in a jar. While Babylon is outside the gates, besieging the city, God tells him to buy land and to secure the deed for the land, like you're going to have to prove that you own this. And, you know, Jeremiah, for his part, wants to know, uh, what is the meaning of this? Because, you know, Babylon's outside the gates here, and yet you've told me to buy this field. And the word of the Lord to Jeremiah in the 27th verse is, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? <laughs> well, no, it's not. He's going to restore them to this land. Which is how you and I have this New Testament, because there was an Israel in the first century after Babylon took these people captive, it was re-established as he said that he would. No, nothing's too hard for him. And I'd remind you of Acts 26 and verse 8 when Paul is being examined in a Roman court. And his question to the, everybody listening is, why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? Acts 26 and verse 8. Why is it incredible? Why can it not be believed that God raises the that God raises the dead? Excuse me. Sorry, I got real dry there. Um, raising the dead is not too hard for God either. He can cause Abraham and Sarah to conceive and have this child beyond childbearing age and years. He can cause the nation to be restored to the land. And yes, he can raise the dead too. That's the power of God. You have to know that. But the other thing Jesus said was, you're wrong because you don't know the scriptures. And on this, I'd like to look at another thing Jesus said in a different place in John chapter 5. But it's useful because in this place, he's speaking to Pharisees. That's to say, he's speaking to people who are sincere and religious, who know the scriptures very well, at least intellectually, they're familiar with what the Bible says. But they're not accustomed to making application of it. They're not really understanding what they're reading. Just like the Sadducees did not understand resurrection must be true because God is the God of the living. So also, the Pharisees are confused about a lot of things. And Jesus in John 5 speaks about a lot of things that have to do with knowledge. The 37th through the 40th verses, he said, The Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you've never heard. His form you have never seen. And you don't have his word abiding in you because you don't believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. 
The first thing he's saying is God sent him. He knows God, and we don't. But that they are resting on what they think of as searching the Scriptures. It's not the same. Clearly, what they're doing isn't the same thing that the noble-minded Bereans did in Acts 17. But he says, in them you think to have eternal life, but it is these very scriptures that bear witness about me. It's just like the Sadducees missing that resurrection. They should have seen from the passage itself, from the way that it's worded, from the way that God speaks about this, that they're clearly alive. There is life after death. So also when we are reading the scriptures, we ought to see Jesus in them. They bear testimony about him. And he continues in the 44th verse. Through the 47th verses. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and don't seek the glory that comes from the only God? Don't think that I will accuse you to the Father. There's one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you've set your hope. Why is that? What's the rationale? It's given in the 46th verse. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, because Moses wrote about me. But if you don't believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Yes, belief. Belief, that's faith. Faith is a knowledge of the power of God and a knowledge of the scriptures, of what he has said. Not just his power, but also what he has said, which you need to know if you want to do what he says. If you want to do what he wants you to do, you're going to have to listen to what he said. And that's faith. The word of the Lord is, if you believed Moses, you would believe me because he wrote about me. If you don't believe Moses' writings, how will you believe my words? Yeah, you can't become the fullness of, of this, this true faith of God if you can't even do the first thing of understanding the patterns of, of the law of Moses, understanding what was written there, the, the facts about God and about his nature. Well, you can't even begin to be a Christian like that. You have to know who God is, what he's capable of, the power of his word. And I'm afraid that this is what you're finding today. People don't believe this. I mean, Christians, it seems, don't believe this. The churches are not teaching this anymore. They're teaching that, you know, you can't understand it. You can't know what he's saying. That's very different from what Jesus said. Haven't you read what God said to you? What was said to you? Haven't you read what was said to you by God? And that question is valid today. That's still true. Haven't you read what was said to you by God? There doesn't need to be something between you and God when you are reading the Bible. Let God speak. Listen to what he's saying. You know, put two and two together. Come to it, to him, in simple trusting faith, believing in his power, and listening to what it says there, being honest with yourself and with what you're reading. Yeah, the mechanism that Jesus espoused would have taught the Sadducees. It would have taught these Pharisees. And it will teach us too. Any thought that, oh, you know, you can't understand the Bible. That's satanic. Why would you think, you know, I, I guess you're, you're, you're right there with, you know, early on with Sarah. Thinking, oh, you know, it's not possible for, for me to have a child. Or, you know, or you're right there with the king of Judah and Jeremiah. Like, why should I be buying this land? 
Or you're right there with the Roman court. Or the Athenians in Acts 17, and you mock the idea of the resurrection from the dead, which is full circle back to the Sadducees in Matthew 22, isn't it? But maybe that's where you're at. Is like that, No, that's not possible. It can't be done. There's a lot more, you know, those things fit with you can't understand the Bible. Those are the same. You can't have a child after 90 years of age. You can't hold on to a deed of land when the country's being taken captive. You can't come back from the dead. (laughs) Those all fit together. What's True, though, is if you do understand that God gave them a child by faith, that God can give them a child, nothing's too hard for him, that God can bring them back to this land, nothing's too hard for him, that God can resurrect his son, Jesus Christ, who is resurrected and is alive today, then, yes, you also can understand what he said. It's not on you, it's on him. Right? If, if the word is not understandable... If it really can't be understood, well, that reflects on God, not us. He's the one who spoke it. He's the one who gave us our minds. He's the one who gave us language. Don't you see? Why would he do that? Why would we think it's impossible for him to reach us, to talk to us, his created? He made us. He made everything in us. How would we think that he doesn't know how to talk to us? That's pure Satanism. That's what that is. Don't be fooled by that. Don't be murdered by the murderer. Let's look at one more place as we close here, talking about what it takes for you to become a child of God, but to become... Bring yourself into a right relationship with God. Have you ever thought of the Bible as a privilege? (laughs) Well, it is. Ephesians 3, verses 1 through 5. For this reason I, Paul, am a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you, all you nations, assuming that you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So God reveals mysteries in the Bible. Paul said, This mystery was given to me by revelation. That's the stewardship of God's grace given to him for us. He was told these things, and he says, as I have written briefly, he wrote it down. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. Sometimes people want to ask you, where's your apostle's license? You ever gotten that one before? I've gotten that one. Where's your apostle's license? It's Ephesians 3, 1 through 5, where the apostle Paul said, I wrote down what God gave to me, and when you read it, you perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. That thing that was a mystery of Christ that was given to the apostle Paul by revelation, it's written down. All you have to do is read it. The Bible is a great privilege. It's it's a great privilege to have access to the very words of the God of the universe. And he's the God of the living. You know, we, uh, our society takes reading for granted, you know. (laughs) Many societies, that's not a given. Um, Certainly historically, and even today, many societies, most people are not literate. They, they rely on somebody else to read. And, and, a lot, and in, in these societies where there are Christians, they dedicate time to reading the scriptures aloud. People will come and sit and listen to the Bible being read because that's the only way they can actually hear the words of God. 
they can't read. Um, which I don't say to shame us for being whatever we are. I'm just saying, realize how privileged we really are. But everybody is privileged by the fact that God speaks to us today through his word, that he has preserved his word for us, that the Bible, you know, is the number one selling book of all time and always is and always has been every single year since books existed. (laughs) The very first book printed was a Bible. Um, God reveals these things to us, and it is a privilege. Won't you take advantage of that privilege? You know, how much time are you spending listening to God talk? (laughs) And now I don't mean by seeing the face of Jesus in a tortilla, you know, as people think that's a vision from heaven or whatever. No, no. I mean, like Jesus said, How much time do you spend reading the Bible? Listening to God say things directly. You know, Peter said in another place that we as newborn babies should long for the pure milk of the word. That's, you know, mother's milk, which is specially formulated by God. And uh, we have been able to determine in modern science, you know, that the composition of mother's milk changes as the baby changes. The composition of mother's milk changes from morning to evening. The formula is different. And the, the, the milk for the child at one month is very different from the milk for the child at three months and nine months and 12 months. Because God gives them exactly what they need, exactly when they need it. (coughs) God's word is like that. When you read that Bible, God is talking to you, and he's telling you exactly what you need, exactly when you need it. That's how it works. Are you a Christian today? Read more. (laughs) Let God do the talking. Let God dictate and follow those dictates. If you've sinned in some way as a Christian and need the prayers of the saints, we'll pray with you. You, We'll help. All of us are capable of the same things. We've all fallen in something or other. We try to encourage you. It should be a safe place to be a Christian, a safe place to be restored to God, you know. (laughs) It's not one of these where people are looking down their nose at you, pointing a finger at you. No, we're glad. We're happy that you have decided to serve God again. Are you a Christian at all? Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus? Well, if not, there is water prepared that you might be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Yes, God raises the dead, and raising the dead is a kind of forgiveness, you know. Forgiveness is a kind of resurrection from the dead, the old dead person can become a new person. You can live differently in Christ Jesus, who provides an escape from every temptation, 1 Corinthians 10 tells us. Become a Christian so that you can have the Savior on your side in your prayers, so that you can have the help of God to deliver you from temptation. Let us help you to obey the gospel. Let us help you with our prayers. Either way, if you let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand, while we sing.